submission and induction of the third batch of insurance arbitration certificate course. I'm Vandana Kannan, a general insurer and a certified insurance arbitrator, having successfully completed the certificate course offered by AIIRN in the first batch. I was introduced to general insurance in the year 1987 when I joined United India Insurance Company as a direct recruit. I have had the opportunity to work in the Middle East for 10 years as an underwriter, as a claims manager, and an insurance trainer. Now I'm the course coordinator for the third batch of certificate program, which is starting from July 25th, 2022. A brief introduction to AIIRN. AIIRN or ASEAN Institute of Insurance and Risk Management was set up in the E3 under the ages of Association for Social and Economic Advancement and NEED. That's the acronym for ASEAN. A not for profit social and educational society which was registered under Societies Registration Act. AIIRM is a not-for-profit organization and it is dedicated to the cause of spreading insurance awareness and education in India and abroad. AIIRM is a representative body of the insurance industry and it comprises of some of the best minds of serving and retired professionals from insurance, banking, finance, health, judiciary, academics, legal, medicine, administrative services, etc. AIIRN, in coordination with various eminent institutions and universities of India, has been conducting courses, organizing seminars, and imparting education and promoting research in the field of insurance. A brief Introduction to AAF now, which is ASEAN Arbitration Foundation. It's the sister organization of AIIRN. It is a Section 8 company set up to expand the footprints of ASEAN in not only promoting various activities in the field of insurance and risk management, but also to develop a flagship institution for alternative dispute resolution. How? By conducting domestic and international arbitration through mediation and conciliation in various fields, including insurance and risk management. Now I'm going to say a few points about ACDR, which is ASEAN Center for Dispute Resolution. So in continuation with this endeavor, ACDR was set up this year, that is in 2022, for providing institutional mechanisms for resolution of disputes related to insurance, and other commercial disputes through arbitration, mediation, and conciliation. The main objective for ACDR are to serve as an arbitral institution and settlement of insurance disputes. Not only insurance disputes, commercial disputes, and other disputes through offline and online modes. Today's seminar, today's webinar, is organized by AIIRN in association with ACDR. On behalf of ACDR and AIIRN, I extend a very warm welcome to the honorable speakers and panelists who are present here. Dr. G. Malikarjun, Mr. Pratap Venugopal, Mr. Masood Bahab, Mr. Ajit Kumar, Mr. Milan Mehta, welcome to this program. And I'm very pleased to welcome our honored guests, Justice L. Nageshwar Rao, Justice A. Hari Prasad, Mr. Neeraj Kumar, Mr. K. B. Vijayshinivas, and Mr. Amarjeet Singh Devi. We are very fortunate to have your presence to this seminar, sir. To all the 30 participants of the third batch ARCC program, I extend a big welcome. You are truly fortunate to be part of this course. Hearty welcome to the participants of our second batch and first batch of AICC program. At this point, I invite Dr. G. Malikarjun, 
Secretary Dr. and Post Director of IACC, who will speak on need for strength dispute resolution for greater insurance penetration. A small brief on Dr. Malikarjun's background. He is an accommodation a unique distinction of having worked with the development finance and refinance organization. Now, two other regulators, that is Reserve Bank of India and IRDAI. He has worked with Reserve Bank of India for nearly 25 years, and after which he took voluntary retirement when he was a general manager to pursue academic. IRDAI for three years, where he worked in consumer affairs department and legal department. He is a fellow. Insurance Institute of India in both life and non life business. He is a PhD in law from National Law Imagine for you. Thank you, madam. <clears throat> so, uh, good morning to all of you, and uh, it's a pleasure to have all of you here. So, I would like to take you through the insurance process. Uh, and then simultaneously discuss about the grievances that emanate during the process and uh, the mechanisms that are there for grievance redressal and the need uh, to have uh, these uh, mechanisms uh, sharpened uh, in order to enable the grievance redressal to be smooth and uh, so that uh, the need for insurance will be taken care of uh, and that would in turn increase the penetration. So that would be the gist of the uh, talk that I will be giving today. So first, starting off, as you are all aware, uh, insurance is a financial service, which is basically aimed at risk protection. And here the mechanism that is involved is risk transfer. So and on this transfer, it is a promise by the insurer in consideration of payment of premium by the insured to make the payment of the sum assured up to the sum assured or insured when in case of a loss suffered by the insured, uh, how due to an insured peril, and in accordance with the agreed terms and conditions, and all this has assume a lot of significance. And from here, we will understand uh, the essential aspects that are involved in this process of insurance, which makes it one of the most uh, complicated kind of a financial service because of the agencies that are involved and because of the process, and more importantly, because of the terms and conditions that are there in it. So first you have the insurer. He has to be registered with IRDA. We see a lot of instances where uh, uh, people are duping and IRDA is coming out with notification saying that you please check whether the person who is offering a product is a registered insurer or not. The second thing is in relation to an insurance product. So till date, we had the comfort of having a file and news system and now there is a, the regulator has moved on and started encouraging the use and file system. So whether the product that is offered is approved under the file and use system or not and uh, whether the product that is given in the use and file system, whether it has been withdrawn or not. So if, if within a very short time of the introduction of use and file, we've had one product where the IRDA has indicated that this product is more like a life insurance product. So you don't issue this product henceforth. So the details relating to unite, unique identification number provided by IRDA for the product terms and conditions and placing it on the website is a very important aspect which brings in the first principle of insurance that is utmost good faith. Then second, publicity material relating to the product is something which is a prospectus or a reading material, etc. So these have to indicate the features, benefits, conditions, exclusions, so as to give the prospect a reasonable chance to identify the product and see whether it is suitable. This is the second aspect where utmost good faith comes into place. Then the once the person is interested based on the disclosures that are made, he will express an intention by giving a proposal. So whether the prospect and the person who is picking up insurance has an insurable interest is something where the second principle of insurance which gets triggered off. Then in the process of selling, there could be a distribution intermediary like a broker or an insurance marketing firm, uh, common service center, etc or it could be a direct sale by the insurer himself. So where the distribution intermediary is there, whether he is registered and authorized a person, whether he has the, the ability to advise the uninformed prospect about it, again, where utmost good faith comes into play. And whether he is eligible to sell the product because of the restriction in terms of the number of insurers 
products that can be sold by individual agents, corporate agents, insurance marketing firms, etc. Then whether he complies with the code of conduct and whether he is eligible to sell the product. So these aspects also are very important, uh, which need to be borne in mind to prevent grievances to be uh, triggered. Then the details relating to the prospect and the risk that is intended to be covered has to be completely given and you shouldn't let the uh, intermediary or the insurer to fill in the gaps which may lead to uh, problems subsequently because whatever disclosures are made become uh, warranties against the person who is making the disclosure. So from that point of view, the utmost good faith requirement on the part of the prospect is something which comes about uh, in the disclosures in the proposal form, which is an important stage. Then the decision whether to give insurance or not, and uh, if the insurer decides to give the insurance, what are the terms and conditions? These have to be communicated very clearly, and uh, this process is what is underwriting, and this is where uh, the insurer's influence uh, and the uh, the brains of the insurers have to come in, and this is something which cannot be hired off to the intermediary. Then. The documentation of the contract is through the insurance policy where the disclosures, the operative part, terms and conditions and other things have to be provided for and uh, the copy of the proposal form is required to be submitted. Then information about the grievance redressal system, then free look cancellation in case of life and health. What are the terms and what are the mechanisms uh, where someone finds that a product which is not uh, something that he wanted or that something that has been promised uh, can be given back. So these comforts that are there for the policy holder have to be provided for in the insurance policy and this is a very important aspect. Then servicing of the policy like renewal, revival, surrender, then nomination, assignment and loan against policy, then recording of important changes which have an implication on claim, etc. have to be provided for. Then once there is a loss, this is the moment when the insurance services utility is tested. So th there has to be an insurable interest sometimes in general insurance at the time when you are giving a claim, then the claims relating to life insurance are largely survival or death claims in case of health insurance, hospitalization or reimbursement claims and general insurance claims are relating to the loss suffered due to insured perils. So you could have claim service intermediaries. If the, the, in the health insurance, you have third party administrators, which is optional for the insurer to engage. Where the amount of claim crosses a particular limit, there is a legal requirement for having a surveyor and loss assessor who is again to be registered with IRDA. And where there is a suspicion of foul play, the insurers and engage investigators to handle the claim. And the next and the most critical part in relation to an insurance product is the claim handling and settlement where the requirement of notice of claim, submission of claim form and documents, then appointment of service surveyor and investigator and obtaining their report within time bound manner at which place the other insurance principle becomes operational like the proximate cause and determining the uh, admissibility of liability and also the quantum of claim in relation to the uh, insurance claim. There are other principles which operate in the general insurance space, which is called as the principle of indemnity. Then where there are more than one insurer, there is a principle of contribution and where there is uh, negligence of a third party, the principle of subrogation also operates. So these are all the important aspects. And then finally, communicating the, the decision with the reasons as far as the claim is concerned is a very important aspect. And now since we have seen the whole gamut of operations which are involved in this insurance, since the person does not have a physical product, it's merely by the promise that he goes and any non delivery or uh, wrong delivery or bad faith in delivery of the product and the claim related aspects trigger grievances. So during the entire insurance cycle, you could have grievances relating to mis-selling, which is a very popular thing as far as uh, a more com most common complaint as far as life insurance and health insurance is concerned. Then you have premium related issues which are common across the whole insurance spectrum. Then you have policy related issues relating to non issuance, then non uh, delay in issuance of policy, etc. Then servicing related issues are also there. Then most importantly, claim related issues like delay in settlement of claim, repudiation of claim or holding up the claim for long, indicating that it is being surveyed, it is being investigated, etc. These are all the kinds of grievances and you could have grievances against the insurers, intermediaries or agents. Then for the redressal, you have mechanisms that are there, which is internal redressal mechanism. So the regulations of IRDA specify that there has to be a board approved policy. 
then there are the officials relating to grievance redressal have to be named and placed on the website and in the publicity documents as well as the officers where you have a grievance redressal officer at the corporate level then grievance officer at virtually every office then you need to have a system of handling grievances an electronic system which is connected with the insurance regulator system for receiving complaints through various channels then for examining these complaints in a time bound manner resolving them providing an opportunity for escalating it for re-examination and finally for disposing of grievance giving reasons. Then the volume of grievances, the mechanism of redressal, etc. is to be made public through public disclosures through quarterly statements that are supposed to be published by the respective insurer and placed in the public domain. Then IRDA provides channels for grievance redressal, but it only makes it very clear that it only facilitates grievance redressal, but it does not uh, adjudicate upon grievances because all unresolved grievances if they are aired to IRDA for resolution they will be just doing grievances rather than their regulatory and supervisory functions but IRDA goes a step beyond uh, the normal uh, facilitation it has provided uh, channels for registering grievances like the integrated grievance call uh, call center which is a toll free number then an electronic system for integrated grievance management uh, where it collates and uh, duplicates the information relating to the grievances so that at a real time basis it will be in a position to assess the efficacy of the grievance redressal system. Then grievance data relating to effectiveness of grievance system, the speed and nature of disposal is monitored by IRDA. Then I, IRDA uses these for the purpose of assessing the market conduct of insurers, finding out what are the important areas of grievance, do the, does the root cause analysis of the grievances and then whether there are system updations which are required at the insurance level or whether there are regulatory changes that are warranted for preventing or reducing grievances or redressing the grievances. This is the input that IRDA gets out of uh, redressal of grievances. And uh, most importantly, this also helps in terms of providing uh, consumer education so that uh, what are the areas where the educated consumer will probably have lesser issues and he will be more willing in terms of taking out the insurance policy and covering his risks. The other alternate channel that is available is the, the insurance ombudsman, but this is basically intended for personal lines of insurance, group policies, sole proprietorship firms and micro enterprises. And the grievances could be against insurers, agents and insurer intermediaries, but the limit is 30 lakhs in terms of pecuniary jurisdiction. Then the ombudsman gives a award and it is indicated to be final in so far if accepted by the customer. Otherwise, if he is not satisfied, he can approach the other channels. So the major commercial policies don't fall within the purview of the insurance ombudsman and that leaves us to the uh, that leaves the policyholders to access uh, take other recourses which are judicial uh, for the purpose of uh, redressal of their grievances. So motor accident claim tribunal, it's basically for the third party liability claims. Then you have consumer fora where even corporates are permitted. The matter is before the Supreme Court, whether they will be, uh, it is, it is, uh, they are permitted to be using the consumer fora for the redressal, but as things stand, these cases of corporates in relation to insurance disputes also land up in the consumer fora. Then civil and commercial courts are, wherever commercial courts have been set up, uh, they will be examining these matters. Otherwise, it will be the civil courts which will be handling these. And if you see the total number of grievances, they are close to two lakh grievances that are there uh, in the system. And uh, the claim related grievances constitute about 20%, uh, 26% of life claims and 60% of the general insurance claims, uh, where claim grievances are relating to general insurance claims. And mis-selling complaint, complaints constitute 20% of the grievances. And uh, in terms of the number of grievances that are uh, unresolved, uh, the channels that they would automatically go if they are falling within the jurisdiction of the ombudsman is the um, ombudsman system. And even uh, the disposal of the grievances, whether it is in favor of the customer or uh, out or partially in favor or rejected, there has been an increase in terms of the complaints which have been either rejected or partially or uh, what is it handled in a manner which is partially in favor of the customer and all those complaints which constitute about 40% of the total complaints will land up in some forum or the other. And as far as insurance ombudsman is concerned, though their mandate is limited, the time that is taken in terms of disposal is very, very uh, long drawn, though it should not be so. 
and part of it is attributable to the absence of ombudsman now at least we have ombudsman who have appointed who have been appointed for all and i hope uh, that the things would improve there but the litigation in so far as uh, insurance is massive in the consumer courts itself in the district forum there are close to 60000 complaints then there are th 22000 complaints uh, which are pending at the state level then in the national consumer forum level there are 3500 complaints that are there and the data that we have in so far as irda's annual report is concerned or the consumer affairs booklet is concerned it's just up to 2019 after that they have not come with the data and more importantly for the past two or three years the consumer forums have not been having adequate members so the disposal rates have plummeted very low then as far as civil courts and other things are concerned there are close to 2000 complaints and appeals and in supreme courts and high courts close to 3000 so the essence of the and uh, how do you say now that uh, with this kind of uh, position relating to claims and grievances, whether people will come and take insurance. The IRDA current chairman is very, very particular about insurance penetration to be improved. We are languishing at 78 US dollars of incidence uh, density and 4.2% of G GDP being the uh, insurance penetration level. Since the realization of promise is reason resulting in grievances and redressal of grievances is getting impacted because of the lax systems that are available in the in the insurer level and the legal system that is there, uh, you cannot expect that people will come and take insurance and insurance will continue to be a push product rather than a pull product. That is in spite of having the need. So notwithstanding COVID, notwithstanding the fact that there have been so many natural calamities, still people hesitate in taking insurance because they shudder at the thought of or the prospect of going and taking a, they are making a claim and getting the money in time. So from that point of view, it is necessary that in addition to consumer education to educate them about the need for insurance, in addition to tuning the intermediaries so as to sell their products in an appropriate manner and facilitate resolution of grievances and intermediate between the policyholder or claimant and the insurer. And finally, efforts by the insurer to not take the customers to litigation but find out via media in terms of uh, settling the grievance without having to take the recourse of long drawn court procedure this is where there is a need for an alternate dispute resolution to be kicked in and, and made very effective so that the insurance grievance redressal will be faster more comfortable and more uh, amicably resolved so that uh, the business will be a continuing business and the importance is more in case of general insurance claims because there is a, already a loss that is there and if this legal process is again long drawn, the entity may go out of business and with the co corporate insolvency resolution process and other things kicking in. So just a, a problem that is there and your insurance uh, being triggered and the litigation continuing, the entity may go out of business. So. Grievance redressal is a very important aspect and there is an absolute crying and rather a dying need for grievance redressal mechanisms to be smoothened and more alternate dispute resolutions to be promoted both at the insurance level and at the regulatory level. The government is doing their bit and the Supreme Court and High Courts are constantly indicating that we need to promote alternate dispute resolution. So this is broadly my submission and I thank all of you for your patient hearing. Maybe I would have overshot by a few minutes but i thought uh, let me link this up so that we get a perspective about the need for grievance redressal strengthening thank you very much and all the best thank you dr malikarjun thank you for highlighting in such an interesting manner the ways and means on improving uh, insurance penetration via resolution of insurance disputes Thank you very much. I now wish to welcome Mr. Pratap Venugopal, Chairman, ASEAN Arbitration Foundation, who will speak on scope for ADR, especially arbitration and mediation in insurance. A small bit about uh, Mr. Pratap. He is a senior advocate with Supreme Court of India. He is also a certified insurance arbitrator belonging to the first batch of IACC. He commenced practice of law at New Delhi in the year 1990. So he has a long uh, background in legal practice. He has become an advocate on record of Supreme Court of India in April 1999. And subsequently, he became a partner in the law firm K. L. John. 
seven years in litigation before the Supreme Court of its tribunals and commissions at Delhi. She also has extensive experience in arbitration, which involved commercial contracts, engineering and building contracts, maritime contracts, etc. Uh, he has conducted landmark cases, including, to name a few, including the SEBI versus Sahara and PACL cases, SBP and Co versus Patel Engineering Limited, involving the nature uh, of the function of the Chief Justice or his designate under Section 11 of Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996. Uh, I present Mr. Pratap Tenukupal to you. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Pratap, and uh, the mic is for you. Uh, thank you. <coughs> the distinguished Chief Guest, Justice Ellen Rao, distinguished panelists, uh, Mr. Masood Wahab, Senior Advisor AIIRM, Mr. Vijay Srinivas, Director General ACDR, Dr. Malik Arjun, Director uh, IAC, COS, and Secretary General of ACDR, faculty members of the IACC, participants in the third batch of the IACC, ladies and gentlemen. The Indian insurance industry has seen significant growth and development in recent years with foreign investment cap for insurance companies having been increased from 49% to 74%, while foreign direct investment up to 100% has been permitted for insurance intermediaries. Now, the past two years have been relatively busy years for the Indian insurance sector with widespread impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and several regulatory changes being introduced by the insurance regulator with the aim of stabilizing the insurance market and securing the protection of policyholders uh, interests. Over the past few years, there has also been an upsurge in the frequency and severity of claims, and this trend seems to be only going upwards in the years to come as the awareness of risks associated with any business increases, and particularly as the legal and regulatory framework tightens. Now, disputes between the insured and insurer usually arise when the insured's claim, which the insured believes is covered under the policy, is rejected either in part or in full by the insurer. There can be disagreement between the insurer and the insured in relation to the scope of the insuring clauses or extensions the, or the applicability of exclusions or compliance with policy terms and conditions and the quantum payable under the policy if liability is admitted. Now, alternate dispute resolution or uh, as it is popularly uh, referred to as ADR refers to the different ways people can resolve disputes without approaching courts and includes uh, include mediation and arbitration. ADR has been successfully used for a number of years as an effective method of resolving a wide variety of insurance related disputes in other jurisdictions. Uh, for example, in the United States, arbitration is used to resolve uninsured uh, motorist and no, no fault cases, as well as subrogation dif uh, uh, disputes between carriers. Now, in the complex world of reinsurance, arbitration has been the preferred method of resolving disputes for more than a century. More recent examples of use of ADR include numerous court annexed programs for personal injury and property uh, uh, damage claims, as well as state mandated programs set up to help resolve disputes arising from natural uh, disasters, such as the Hurricane Katrina uh, program administered by the American Arbitration Association, uh, popularly known as the AAA. Now, despite its use in a variety of disputes, ADR is not currently the norm in insurance disputes. This is because many standard form commercial policies issued in India do not contain ADR clauses. Further, strangely, in insurance policies in India, arbitration clause, uh, if included, provides for arbitration only with respect to quantum and subject to the condition that the claim is not denied. There is no exclusive uh, uh, procedure or, uh, nor are there any uh, exclusive judicial venues in India for resolution of insurance disputes. So insurance disputes in the absence of an arbitration clause can be litigated only before the civil courts or consumer forums. As far as consumer forums are concerned, as uh, Dr. Malikarjun has uh, uh, informed you, uh, though complaints by companies and other entities under the Cons uh, Consumer Protection Act or CPA are currently being entertained, the issue whether such complaints by uh, companies or other entities 
uh, uh, can be entertained uh, under the CPA and whether such companies and entities fall within the definition of consumer under the CPA stand referred to a larger bench of the Supreme Court. Now, ADR methods such as arbitration and mediation provide insurers and their policy holders with the opportunity for private, flexible, as well as quicker, less expensive dispute resolution with more amicable out outcomes than a court-based dispute resolution option. Such benefits may be particularly attractive for commercial insurance disputes for a number of reasons. Arbitrations, for example, are confidential and set no precedence. Therefore, from an insurer's point of view, there is less concern that a decision involving an unsettled area of the law, which is fairly common in coverage disputes, will set a precedent. Therefore, there is less concern that an adverse award or even settlement will have ramifications beyond the particular matter. Now, from a policyholder's perspective, there is less concern regarding the possible release of proprietary information subject to discovery or the need for protective orders. Confidentiality allows both sides to deal with the matter at hand without allowing the potential impact on other disputes to get in the way of resolution. Commercial insurance disputes frequently involve highly complex issues. Now, coverage disputes in particular often involve cutting edge questions of law. Unfortunately, in court proceedings, those involved may not be well enough, averse enough to deal with these issues. In arbitration, however, organizations such as our own ASEAN Arbitration Foundation or AF offer neutrals with specific expertise in these areas and arbitration allows the parties to select the neutral or neutrals who will decide their case. Commercial insurance disputes can take at least two to three years to be resolved in courts, whereas the average arbitration can take less than a year. From a policyholder's perspective, speed is paramount. The length of time it takes to resolve a claim could have a significant impact on a policyholder's livelihood, for example. Resolving claims in the most efficient and expeditious manner possible is a goal shared by insurers as it eliminates the unpredictable costs associated with unresolved matters. Now, arbitration and mediation are definitely less expensive than litigation. From an insurer's perspective, executives as well as underwriters understand the effect that litigation costs can have on an organization's bottom line. This need to manage legal fees associated with the dispute is shared by policyholders as well. Insurance companies benefit from including arbitration clauses that encourage parties to reach common sense dispute resolution in their agreements. Arbitration is a creature of contract, which means the parties have the opportunity to design their dispute resolution process as part of their contractual agreement. In the context of standard commercial policies, items such as method of selection of arbitrators, number of arbitrators, the locale, the governing law, remedies, etc. can be addressed in the ADR clause itself. Often, insurers and policyholders are able to negotiate up to a point, but are unable to close the gap, so to speak. So for this type of resolution, parties might set up a mediation that could result in an acceptable resolution within that gap. This eliminates extreme risk and preserves the benefits of prior negotiations and such options are not available in courts. Generally speaking, mediation works. Mediation conducted too early in the dispute resolution process may impact an insurer's or policyholder's willingness to compromise. On the other hand, significant legal costs associated with litigation in courts might make mediation worthy of consideration earlier rather than later in the process. To sum up, all stakeholders and uh, uh, the insurance regulator IRDA should re-examine commercial insurance policies and consider adding ADR clauses where they are absent. It, this is a, a, a too powerful tool to ignore as it could lead to quick and amenable consensus on otherwise protracted expensive disputes. Now, one of the objects of uh, the uh, ASEAN Arbitration Foundation or AF is to further ADR in the field of uh, insurance. AF to further this objective has set up the ASEAN uh, Center for Dispute Resolution or ACDR, which provides for mediation and arbitration, including in the field of insurance. Now, ACDR, in order to make available the best impartial expertise available, has strict norms for accreditation and subsequent empanelment. And uh, one of the qualifications uh, for accreditation is successful completion of the Insurance Arbitration Certificate course, or IACC. Now, ACDR has also exhausted uh, rules for the conduct of ADR proceedings in order to provide a speedy and cost-effective resolution of disputes, both online or virtually, as also 
at physical venues, leaving the choice to the parties concerned. I wish all the participants in the third batch of the IACC the very best and hope to welcome many, if not all of them, as AF accredited and empaneled arbitrators and mediators in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pratap. Thank you. You have very lucidly provided us details of what is the scope of insurance today. Thank you once again. Um, we are very fortunate to have with us today Justice uh, L. Nageshwar Rao, former judge, Supreme Court of India, who will inaugurate this arbitration certificate course, and he will also give us a keynote address. Uh, I would like to give a brief on uh, Justice Rao. Justice Rao is the seventh person elevated directly from the bar to the Supreme Court and was sworn in on May 13, 2016. He was a senior advocate and a former additional solicitor general practiced in Andhra Pradesh High Court before shifting his practice to the Supreme Court of India. He was designated as a senior advocate. Mrs. Rao has appeared in Karnataka High Court for J. Jailalita in the disproportionate asset case. He was successful in reversing and getting her acquitted. One of the last cases he argued before the Supreme Court of India was in which he was the case. He appeared for State of Tamil Nadu and Christian Medical. Medical College. This L. Nageshwar is also a trustee of the Hyderabad International Arbitration and Mediation Center, which is the first of such kind uh, center in India. Justice Rao will address us valuable insights on the growing importance of institutional arbitration in commercial dispute resolution in India. We would also like to request Honorable Justice to formally inaugurate the third batch of the insurance arbitration certificate course, classes of which are scheduled to start from tomorrow, Monday, the 25th of July, 2022. Welcome, uh, Justice Rao, and uh, we wait to hear you. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. At the outset, uh, I'm uh, pleased to inaugurate uh, the IACC, the third batch of uh, persons who are uh, going to start uh, their training uh, from Monday. I am uh, indebted uh, for this invitation by the ASEAN Institute of Insurance and uh, Risk Management to this uh, webinar being conducted on the need for institutional arbitration. I have heard with interest uh, the presentation of uh, Ms. Vandana uh, Kannan, uh, who gave the introductory and welcome address, as well as uh, Mr. G. Malikarjan, Secretary General of the ASEAN Center for Dispute Resolution, as well as uh, my good friend, Mr. Pratap Vedegopal, who is the Chairman of the uh, ASEAN Arbitration Foundation and uh, Advocate of the Supreme Court of India. The topic uh, that has been given to me uh, for uh, uh, today's webinar uh, relates to growing importance of institutional arbitration in a commercial dispute resolution in India. To start with, uh, I wanted to uh, speak about uh, the question that might uh, arise in the mind of uh, persons as to why there is a need for arbitration when we have uh, a well set a judicial infrastructure as well as a, a well, well oiled mechanism of courts uh, in this country. Uh, it is uh, common knowledge that uh, the judiciary is uh, bursting at its uh, seams. The number of cases that are uh, pending in court are about uh, four. 0.4 crores when you take the civil courts uh, to the uh, Supreme Court. And uh, according to the statistics provided by Niti Aayog, 
So disposal of all these cases is going to take about 320 years. Alternate dispute uh, resolution uh, was something uh, that was being thought of uh, for the past 40, 50 years the world over to reduce the pressure on the courts and to relieve the courts of uh, making decisions in all matters, uh, petty and sundry included. Dispute resolution which can be restricted uh, to courts uh, can be of uh, complicated questions uh, which need attention of uh, trained judicial minds and uh, where there is a complicated uh, questions of law that would also arise to be considered by courts. There are several cases, uh, the majority of the cases that are, uh, sent, that are going to court which can be uh, settled by resort to alternate dispute uh, resolution mechanism. With this thought, the process of uh, alternate dispute uh, resolution uh, comments, which includes uh, negotiation, mediation, conciliation, and uh, arbitration. The Arbitration Act, the first Arbitration Act uh, in India was uh, in the 19th century. The act that we all know of uh, is the 1940 Act, uh, which uh, was really not working well as an alternative to uh, litigation. And thereafter, the 1996 Act was uh, made uh, following the unsettled model, trying to make it uh, more uh, consumer friendly and uh, which would provide a quicker resolution uh, to the disputes without. Uh, too much of uh, judicial intervention. The Arbitration Act of uh, 1996 uh, is uh, neutral and uh, it is arbitration agnostic. It does not have uh, any separate provision which are geared toward, uh, towards promoting institutional arbitrations. Having talked about uh, the need for uh, arbitration in the place of uh, litigation in courts, so let us straight away go to the topic of the importance of institutional arbitrations in comparison to the ad hoc arbitrations uh, which are resorted to by parties in this country. As I am asked to speak generally on uh, commercial arbitrations. Uh, I would like to make a presentation on commercial arbitrations for the present and uh, thereafter speak about arbitrations uh, which arise in the insurance industry. Persons uh, who resort to uh, arbitrations uh, under the 1996 uh, Arbitration Act would have clauses in the agreements uh, initially when they enter into contracts uh, which provide that they would resolve uh, disputes in accordance with the Arbitration Act. Arbitration uh, which is uh, driven by party autonomy where uh, the parties to the uh, agreement or contract as Mr. Renvotan was telling you they have a choice uh, of uh, the arbitrators uh, who will, uh, who are third parties who will resolve the disputes, the applicable law, the, the seat of the arbitration, and uh, the procedure that is to be followed in arbitrations, in the process of arbitration. These are ad hoc arbitrations. And in case the parties do not agree upon appointment of an arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators, the High Court in case of domestic arbitrations and the Supreme Court in case of uh, international arbitrations appoints uh, arbitrators under Section 11 of the Arbitration Act. 
finding that even the 1996 Act has not really worked well and uh, it was desirable for uh, changes to be made to the Act. There were amendments that were made to the Arbitration Act in 2015 and uh, 2019. After the 2015 Act was made, on the recommendation made by the uh, Law Commission of India, and certain comments made by the Supreme Court in cases that were coming up before the court. Justice P. Krishna was uh, asked to, to submit a report about uh, the need for amendments to be made to the Arbitration Act uh, with stress on introduction of uh, provisions which promote institutional arbitration. The present Attorney General, Mr. Venugopal, and the retired the Supreme Court Judge Justice, Justice Indu Malhotra, present Supreme Court Judge Justice, uh, Justice Ravindra Bhatt and uh, Justice Narsimha, apart from other senior advocates, were also members of the high level committee, which spoke to several people who are experts in arbitration. They called for responses from various institutions. And after a thorough study of uh, the issues that were placed before uh, the committee, a report was submitted by Justice uh, uh, Sri Krishna, who was the chairman of the committee, on behalf of the committee. It was taken into consideration by the government, and thereafter there was an amendment to the 2019 Act. Mr. Sri Krishna in his uh, uh, report looks at both ad hoc arbitration and institutional arbitration and examines the advantages and disadvantages of uh, both ad hoc as well as institutional arbitrations. Weighing the pros and cons, the committee has recommended that institutional arbitration has to be uh, promoted. Identifying the issues relating to the preference that is given to ad hoc arbitration, the committee found that there are various factors as to why parties prefer ad hoc arbitration. The first is lack of arbitral institutions which have credibility in this country. In a survey that was conducted by Queen Mary's College in 2019, the five most preferred arbitral institutions uh, in the world are London, Singapore, Hong Kong, Geneva, and Malaysia. India is still considered to be an arbitration unfriendly jurisdiction because of various factors, one of which pertains to the process of arbitration itself, the delays as well as the expense involved in ad hoc arbitrations. Though there are about 30 institutions in India which conduct arbitrations, Justice Sri Krishna in his report said that lack of credibility does not infuse a confidence in parties to approach an institution for conducting their arbitration and would prefer to have ad hoc arbitration. The second issue that was highlighted by Justice uh, Sri Krishna Committee is relating to the misconceptions that people have about institutional arbitrations. The advantages of an ad hoc arbitration is that uh, the parties have the uh, leverage to appoint arbitrators of their choice to start with and have a say in matters of procedure as to how arbitration should be conducted, when it should be conducted, how the matters have to be taken up, etc. 
there is a misconception that once the matter is taken up by an institution which conducts arbitrations, the parties lose uh, control over the uh, arbitrations, which is a misnomer. Institutions uh, which conduct the arbitrations would be more advantageous because of the set of rules which are followed by the institution, which are to the knowledge of both parties which are approaching the institution for conducting arbitration. Most of the institutions permit the parties to choose their arbitrators only in case of uh, their failure in choosing arbitrators, then arbitrators are appointed from a panel of arbitrators. And mind you, though the Singapore International Arbitration Center and the other centers have a panel of arbitrators, the ICC doesn't even have a panel of arbitrators. They choose arbitrators, if at all they are given a chance, from a panel of uh, internationally acclaimed and credible arbitrators. And when does that situation arise? That situation arises when parties do not agree for appointment of arbitrators or if there is a panel of three arbitrators, two nominated arbitrators do not agree upon the presiding arbitrator, then it would be left to the institution to appoint arbitrators. How do the, how do the international arbitration centers help in the process of uh, arbitration? In comparison to ad hoc arbitration, where at the Initial stages, even before the matter is taken up, there would be disputes between parties, and then parties would be rushing to court for uh, interlocutory at the interlocutory stage for various orders. Once the institution with the fixed uh, rules conducts the arbitration, the chance of parties appearing going before court for orders uh, would not arise, though it has to be said that the present Arbitration Act gives power to the arbitral tribunals uh, to decide even on their jurisdiction as well as matters uh, at the interlocutory stage and courts are reluctant to interfere. But the chances of persons approaching court at the drop of a hat would definitely reduce once the institutions uh, conduct the arbitrations. Further, the institutions would have case managers who would be assigned to the parties for conduct of their proceedings and the institutions would ensure that the arbitrations are conducted in accordance with the schedule and the other misnomer is that institutional arbitrations are expensive which is not correct. Though there is a fee that is charged by institutions to conduct arbitrations, that is only a nominal fee as, long, as far as I know by the institutions in India as well as outside. But in comparison to ad hoc arbitrations, where the arbitration takes uh, more than the required time as fixed by the Arbitration Act because parties can agree to extension of time, more often than not, uh, credible arbitral institutions complete the arbitrations on time because they have control over the arbitrations and the arbitrators are given credit points for completion of arbitrations on time. And the arbitrators are pressured to complete their work within the schedule that is given. Apart from this, some institutions also study the awards and even rectify the defects which would reduce the scope of interference of the awards by court. Till now we were speaking of the stage where the arbitration is conducted. Arbitration being an alternate dispute resolution is an effective alternate remedy as the parties decide to get their dispute resolved to the third parties by the arbitrators who they appoint or the institutions appoint. The resolution of the dispute is uh, binding on the parties, unlike mediation, which is also an effective alternative remedy, but it's not binding on the parties. The question is whether 
after the award is passed by a tribunal, would the problems of uh, the litigant be solved or are they coming to an end? The 1940 Act needed an amendment by the 1996 Act and further amendments because of judicial interference against awards. Justice Sri Krishna points out uh, that one of the factors which has to be taken into account uh, for arbitrations to be encouraged and people embracing them would be the judicial attitudes toward arbitration in general. The law has been very clear that interference with the awards under the 1996 Act can only be in extraordinary circumstances which have been mentioned in Section 34 of the Act. The law has been very clear that it's only those circumstances which are mentioned which would give a delay to the courts to interfere with awards. But the experience has been slightly different as certain courts would interfere in awards on the basis of their appreciation of evidence which is not to be done. The higher courts have been at pains to reiterate that arbitrary awards which are given by parties should not be interfered with lightly. And the scope for interference is very limited to the grounds that are mentioned in section 34 of the act. Apart from the grounds of interference, there is a need to spruce up the mechanism of expediting petitions filed under section 34 to be decided early. There is a remedy of an appeal against uh, an order passed under section 34, under section 37 of the act, and thereafter parties would uh, approach the Supreme Court and this is again delaying the process of finality of the arbitral award. So the need for judicial attitudes to be changed and courts become arbitration friendly uh, would go a long way in improving the arbitral processes and also infusing confidence in the public to resort to arbitration, which is a much, much easier method than litigation. To compare arbitration with the litigation, a suit being filed in the court for a, for a dispute and then with the, all the tires that are available, uh, it is going to take at least 15, 20 years for a resolution of dispute and no person, especially having a commercial dispute, is willing to wait for such a long time to get a result. And that's the reason why people don't resort to courts. The other problem that has been pointed out uh, by uh, this is Sri Krishna, is the lack of governmental support for institutional arbitrations. Take the case of Singapore International Arbitration Centre, which has been established by the Singapore government in the year 1992. Singapore International Arbitration Centre is uh, the busiest arbitration centre in the Asia Pacific region. And uh, till 2008, there were only about 32 cases before the arbitration center. It's only after 2008, Singapore International Arbitration Center picked up. And now, the number of cases that are handled by the Singapore International Arbitration Center are in hundreds. And 30 to 35 percent of the dispute that, disputes that go before the Singapore International Arbitration Center go from parties who are from India. The reason for Indian parties going to the Singapore International Arbitration Centre where the applicable law is uh, the Indian law is because of again going back to this first point which was uh, highlighted by the Sri Krishna Committee that is lack of credible arbitral institutions in India. So there is a need for governmental support for a setting of arbitral centers like the Singapore International Arbitration Center which has the blessings of the government. Even the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center also has the support of the government where infrastructure has been provided by the, uh, the government. The need for credible institutions with the support of the uh, government, uh, which has been uh, pointed out by Sri Krishna, 
has been taken advantage by the Telangana government, uh, which has thought of uh, starting the Hyderabad International and uh, International Arbitration and uh, Mediation Center. They have provided uh, the infrastructure and the International Arbitration Center has a governing council with uh, three international arbitrators and other persons uh, who are experts in uh, the field of uh, arbitration who would be in charge of running the center. Though I was appointed as a life trustee along with Justice uh, Ravindran, who is a retired judge, and Justice Hikmar Kohli, the sitting judge, is a trustee along with the sitting chief justice of the High Court and the law minister. There is no role for us to play because the arbitration center, according to the rules, is uh, supposed to be run only by the governing council without any interference either from the judiciary or uh, from the executive government. And that's how the Singapore Arbitration Center has done well. Because of the rules uh, that have been framed, we expect that uh, the parties who have commercial uh, disputes in this country can resolve their uh, disputes uh, in a better manner, where disputes would be taken up by experts in their own fields, appointed by the parties themselves, or by a panel of arbitrators who it would be prepared by the center. I want to make a point here that uh, there is uh, some sort of uh, feeling that it's only retired judges of the Supreme Court or High Court who would make good arbitrators because of uh, their judicial training, with which I disagree. You need the uh, domain experts uh, as uh, arbitrators, and especially in uh, matters of uh, specialization of subjects like maritime law and like construction disputes, taxation disputes, and uh, why take insurance also. You might need people who are trained in insurance to act as uh, arbitrators. I think there's a need for preparing a panel as we have discussed it, uh, in the meetings of the Northern Council. Separate panels to be prepared from uh, domain experts. So, this is one area which uh, needs to be taken care of according to uh, Justice Sri Krishna Kamiti. And the last point which he says, which he speaks about as to why people are not resorting to institutional arbitrations, is the lack of legislative support. The legislative support comes from the statute itself. The statute being the Arbitration Act of 1996. When the Singapore International Arbitration Centre can uh, appoint arbitrators and parties to approach it, the provision which existed in the 1996 Act confers that power on the High Court, as I already said, in respect of domestic arbitrations for appointment of arbitrators and the Supreme Court in respect of uh, the international arbitrations. An amendment was made uh, to the Act by which the Chief Justice of uh, the uh, Court has been given the power to nominate arbitral institutions for appointment of arbitrators on the basis of their accreditation by the Arbitral Council of India. The problem is that uh, the amendment that is being made <coughs> to the Arbitration Act has included a separate chapter relating to the Arbitral Council of India being established by a high powered uh, committee which would uh, supervise arbitral institutions and uh, take forward arbitrations and also deal with the problems of arbitrations generally. <laughs> As that chapter has not been notified, <coughs> the High Courts 
have not started acting under the amended provisions of Section 7 by nominating the arbitral institutions to appoint arbitrators. <coughs> I have seen that uh, the Supreme Court has uh, referred matters for appointment of arbitrators to the Mumbai International Arbitration Center in a few cases. <laughs> That's under the power that is conferred on the uh, Supreme Court. The problem for appointment of arbitrators uh, by the courts <coughs> has arisen because of the number of petitions that are filed under 11.6 being pending for a long number of years before the High Court. I have been told by the Chief Justice of the Court that there are. <coughs> Petitions filed under 11.6 for appointment of arbitrators pending for the past three to four years, which means that the party wants a dispute to be resolved. There's a disagreement on the appointment of arbitrators, and so he approaches the court for with a request for appointment of an arbitrator, and there we are. The matter is still at that stage. Arbitrators are not appointed. Assuming that the procedure of appointment of arbitrators is handed over immediately to the institutions and the institutions immediately they don't delay and they appoint the arbitrators and uh, the arbitration uh, kick starts so that would provide an impetus to the arbitration proceeding itself where there would not be any uh, delay. Now while referring to why institutional arbitration should be preferred over ad hoc arbitration, I just tell you the five Problems that people normally think of when they want an ad hoc arbitration. To buttress my point that there is a need, there is an imperative need for institutional arbitration to be encouraged. In my own words, ad hoc arbitration, but when you compare ad hoc arbitration with institutional arbitration, institutional arbitration is run by a well-oiled uh, mechanism of an institution where people are certain about the rules which would govern their arbitrations and uh, they also know that uh, things would be on time and would also be cost effective ultimately because of uh, time uh, being short in matters decided by the institutional arbitrations. I want to say a few words on uh, insurance arbitrations. Even in the uh, 17th century, the Lord Mansfield uh, recognized that uh, the claims in respect of insurance uh, are always exaggerated claims. And as Prabhat Vrindagopal was mentioning, it is only the quantum uh, that is arbitrable in India as so far as insurance is concerned, which is uh, different from the practice in the uh, United States of America where uh, the entire matter can be uh, arbitrated upon. We still follow the uh, Scott versus uh, Avery Clause of uh, 1964 where the insurer uh, denies uh, liability that there is no question of any arbitration even if there is an arbitration clause. And with my experience of uh, having seen uh, arbitration clauses in insurance contracts, though it is mentioned that uh, the dispute can be arbitrated upon, there would definitely be uh, a condition mentioned that it's only in case where the insurer admits liability and offers settlement, which means that the dispute pertains only to the quantum, which is uh, arbitrable. All of you being from the insurance field, uh, you are aware of the circulars that are issued by the IRDA saying that uh, merely because uh, a party says that uh, he wants to uh, settle a particular matter, it cannot be said that he does not have the right to approach uh, the courts for redress of his uh, grievances, which means that he wants to leave certain things open, which means that if he agrees on one point, it can't be a full discharge. That's a different aspect altogether. The Supreme Court has considered the arbitration clauses in insurance contracts and uh, they have upheld those uh, clauses to say that 
arbitration can be resorted to only in case of quantum. Now, Mr. Venugopal and Mr. Malika have been also referring to the reference of uh, the matter which was uh, decided by the Supreme Court earlier relating to the disputes of uh, arbitrations uh, in insurance contracts being decided by the Consumer Disputes Forum. Because the existing law is that the Consumer Disputes uh, Forum has jurisdiction over matters pertaining to insurance contracts and claims, but that's going to be considered by a larger bench, uh, the correctness of which is subtly set presently. I've heard uh, Mr. Venugopal, Mr. Malikarman saying that uh, there are about 60,000 disputes that are pending uh, in uh, various fora, at several tasks in uh, the consumer uh, forums, as well as uh, other uh, a few thousands in uh, the uh, Supreme Court. Though I am aware of the fact that uh, there are uh, false claims that are made, that there are exaggerated claims that are made in insurance, which is the common experience of everybody. I am not sure whether it would be advisable even for the insurance companies uh, to uh, keep fighting the litigation in uh, courts uh, in cases of genuine claims instead of taking a hardened stand. Mediation would be a very uh, useful tool uh, for settling these disputes uh, unnecessarily without uh, spending too much time in court and effort of uh, personnel in the insurance companies. We all know that ultimately the claim made is allowed, it also carries interest, and it would be an insurance company which uh, loses out. There would be a need, according to me, that uh, there would be no problem, actually, for the insurance company to agree for mediation of certain disputes at least, which would uh, narrow down the problem. And if the matters can be arbitrated upon by experts in arbitration, not permitting cases to be taken up by the consumer disputes uh, redressal forums where normally the kill tips towards the claimants because the consumers would be speaking of uh, deficiency of service. Would it not be better that these disputes are uh, resolved amicably by the software algorithm dispute resolution mechanisms? And the idea of uh, institution arbitrations would come in here because of my experience with uh, the Hyderabad International Arbitration Center where the claims that are made by MSMEs, medium and small scale uh, enterprises, are running into a few thousands uh, in the state of Telangana, which are going to be referred uh, to the arbitration center according to the request that was made, that was made by the center, the government is examining it. Medium and small scale industries have uh, uh, claims of a few lakhs uh, against the government and uh, there is a complaint that even those claims are not being taken up and completed on time. The time that is given for completion of the act is three months. So we have volunteered uh, and made a request to the government in case those claims are not completed within three months, those claims also can be sent to the center and then we will try to resolve the disputes early. So merely because it's a small claim, it doesn't mean that the institutions uh, uh, would be very expensive to complete the uh, task and it would be a good idea to approach the institutions so that the resolution would be much faster. There is an imperative need for uh, the executive as well as the experts in institution in, the, in uh, insurance uh, companies uh, to think about uh, claims pertaining to insurance contracts being settled through arbitration and that too through uh, institutional uh, arbitrations. Why don't we follow the American method? 
the American method being that uh, it need not be only the quantum, but the entire uh, matter can be resolved through arbitration process or through mediation process, which would put an end to the uh, claim or uh, dispute. You cannot avoid disputes. Any commercial contract, whether it is an insurance contract or whether it is any other contract, uh, disputes are bound to arise. What is to be found out is uh, the ease of doing business uh, between people and the resolution of disputes early, quicker resolution of disputes uh, in an expensive manner. We are thinking of uh, improving our economy. We are also inviting parties from uh, outside this country to come and invest in this country. One of the issues that arises uh, for consideration of any investor is uh, in case I have a dispute, uh, is it going to be resolved in a fair and impartial manner? Is it going to be a faster resolution of the dispute or would I have to wait for a long number of years? What I am speaking on the international front would be applicable even uh, to domestic uh, disputes especially the incidence disputes. So, my dear friends, I would uh, leave you with this thought that uh, there is a need to explore the possibility of getting the entire matter relating to an incidence dispute being decided by alternate dispute resolutions like mediation, negotiation, conciliation and, of course, arbitration which is binding, which is slightly different from the earlier most that I mentioned and with preference to institutional arbitrations. Uh, I thank for the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my ideas about the need for encouraging institutional arbitration. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Justice Rao, for uh, your words on importance, how important uh, institutional arbitration is today. And um, we are definitely richer in knowledge by hearing your views, why it is important and how it is to be encouraged in the current times. Thank you once again, sir.